Uh, William, it's good to see you and talk to you. Um, it's been a while. It's been a while since you've done one of these episodes. You are famous in the East as a podcast lore for these insanely long articles, and you have done it again. This is a, what was it, 40,000 word article that you wrote on what really happened on October 7th. It's a mammoth, mammoth read. I'm actually going to petition UCLA for a second PhD just for reading this article because it was so much fucking work, but it was good. It was really good. It was a really sprawling piece. I keep meaning to have Asa Winstanley on the show. I'm going to harass him to come on. Maybe you guys can do it together because he's also been chasing down this story. But before we get into that, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are uh, for people who may not have listened to your prior episodes. Yeah, again, my name is uh, William Van Wagenen, and um, I've been writing uh, for years about the civil war in Syria, or really the CIA-backed dirty war on Syria that started in 2011. And currently I write for The Cradle, a uh, geopolitical magazine uh, focusing on West Asia. So for The Cradle, I've been focusing, like everyone, I guess, these days, of course, on the genocide in Gaza. And again, wrote this uh, very long, uh, detailed article about what uh, really happened on the 7th of October for the uh, Al-Aqsa flood uh, yeah. Hamas attack. And um, so, yeah, just happy to be able to chat about it. And thanks for inviting me on and, and taking the time to read through it because it is long, but it is very, uh, yeah, very detailed. And it's similar to the to the work I did on, on Syria. Yeah, so I guess at the outset, I mean, there's a, I mean, we were saying this off mic, but kind of the way I approach this, um, the way I'm approaching this essay, this this article, and actually the sort of the broader story of what happened on October 7th is that it actually, in some ways, at this point, after everything we've seen for almost six months, um, it's coming up to six months. So I guess five weeks, it's been five weeks and, and two and almost two, five and a half weeks. Uh, sorry, five months and a, five and a half months. There we go. Um, at this point, it actually doesn't matter what happened on October 7th, in a way. Now, I don't mean that in a, um, I don't mean to dismiss anyone who died or anyone who was martyred on that day or anything, the sort of scale of the meaning of October 7th. But in some ways, the actual details themselves, I think at this point, in terms of the, let's say like in where we sort of in the journalistic matter of things so like who got killed by whom when at what point where what was said about them at this point it seems almost like it doesn't matter now i'm going to caveat that again and say that it actually does matter because it sh it the the point of october 7th was to was to um i guess in some ways was to break the status quo this sort of like genocidal status quo of the, the slow suffocation of Gaza and was to was to help break out was it was a kind of mass prison bake but that's that's getting into it too early I feel because I feel like we're gonna it's better for me to let you take the floor and sort of explain what actually did happen on October 7th at this point and I was thinking maybe we can start with the close of your article because you quote a um you quote, where is it? Uh, did I just close it? I think I did. Oopsies. You quote a um, an American military official. And you say something interesting about... Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Come on, I'm just scrolling. It takes this long to scroll, uh, the article. Okay. Um, you quoted... Uh, I'm going to edit all this out because this is tedious. But why... This is at the very end. Under the sub, the second, the second, the, the penultimate subheading is the Dahia Doctrine. Quote, but why is Israel intent on killing civilians on a mass scale in Gaza? As Kenneth McKenzie, a retired Marine Corps general and former top American commander in the Middle East observed on October 8th, quote, Hamas has challenged the very, very fundamental concept of Israeli deterrence. It can only be reestablished with the application of overwhelming, shocking violence, and it is only getting started. So he said this on October 8th. So this was a prescient, um, a prescient observation on the part of this military, on the part of this military guy, who himself is part of his own genocidal military force. So he would know. But I guess in some ways, this, this sort of grabbed my attention because the, the accomplishment of October 7th was to disrupt 
the sovereignty of Israel in how it pursues its violence over Gaza and to a lesser extent over the West Bank and how it how it imagines itself the military sort of um, the military power in the region over this over these indigenous people that it's ruled for over 75 years. So maybe at the outset, can you begin with, you know, a, uh, can you begin with what your assessment is of what October 7th, the intention behind it, like the sort of author's intention, if, if you can describe that on the part of the Palestinian resistance? Well, Hamas and Palestinians in general were extremely isolated um, as of October 7th. The Saudis were in the process of normalizing uh, with Israel. Uh, Turkey, Erdogan was trying to do energy deals with Israel to move natural gas, including from the Gaza fields uh, to Europe. Um, Qatar, of course, is always uh, doing uh, what the Israelis and the Americans want. And even Iran had just reached um, this deal with the U.S. to have $6 billion released in uh, oil revenue that the U.S. had seized under this uh, pretext of sanctions. And there was the prisoner exchange between the two sides. And there's another $10 billion more money coming from, uh, you know, the Americans towards the Iranians. And there was uh, the really extreme Jewish supremacist government took uh, power uh, a year before with uh, Itamar Ben-Gavir and Bezalel Smotrich joining the coalition with uh, Netanyahu. They were escalating violence in the West Bank, talking about annexing the West Bank, um, accelerating uh, settlement building. So Hamas was just really isolated and the Palestinian issue was just not on the table internationally. And the siege uh, on Gaza, of course, was uh, was terrible as usual. Even Qatar had even cut off funding to pay uh, salaries to Hamas uh, uh, government employees in Gaza. And so they were just in a really, in my opinion, kind of desperate uh, position. And Musa Abu Marzouk, uh, Hamas official that's based abroad, he even said that. He, he said to uh, the New Yorker, I believe, in the days after the beginning of the operation that, um, you know, they, they were just isolated and, and, and they were, had basically reached a dead end. And so launching the operation was a way of putting the Palestinian issue back on the, on the international agenda and trying to get some hope for breaking the siege on Gaza and uh and the slow uh you know ongoing displacement from the west bank or the slow ongoing genocide i guess you could say that has been going on for 75 years so in my opinion that's why they hamas launched the attack when they did yeah so i guess in some ways yeah there was there i agree i agree with that um there there had been there had been a lot of there had been a lot of radical changes especially since Seif al Quds, right, which was from 2022, um, this kind of smaller version of what we've seen unfolded for the last six months. Um, so, and that didn't, that seemed to like not upset, uh, th that didn't seem to upset the status quo in, in a real way. It just seemed like one of these periodic skirmishes, albeit punctuated with a larger, um, a response, a larger resistance response from the Palestinians in Gaza. But I guess at this point, like, I think, and I don't mean, I, I want to say this, you know, I don't mean to diminish anything that happened on October 7th, but the thing is that like whatever happened, right? There's nothing, there's nothing that could justify genocide, right? Genocide is the ultimate, is the ultimate crime that a human, that like a state can pursue. And there's nothing that can justify that. So I, I wonder sometimes about the very utility of examining what happened on October 7th, because, you know, like, it pales in comparison because they're unfolding on October 7th every day, times 10, right? Since in the aftermath, right? In terms of the scale of the Zionist crimes in Gaza, right? And then also in the West Bank too, to a lesser extent. However, it is important to sort of think about how the, cha the, the chain of events and what use and what the strategy and how Israeli, as you make clear in your article, the way that, you know, Zionist leaders have uh, obfuscated the authorship, let's say, of October 7th, of who, uh, who authored the most amount of death and who authored the death, who engineered the deaths of so many of, of Israeli settlers, right? Like settler Zionists 
And and I think at some point it is obviously useful, and it sort of it obviously it is it is useful to sort of deconstruct the wave of fictions that came out after October seventh that were then that were in the that were then picked up by the Western press, which is also Zionist but of a different kind, and amplified as a way of paving the way for this genocidal Israeli response. I, say, it, I think it does make a difference because um, it, it says something about the nature of Hamas as an organization. And because Palestinians in Gaza, as far as I can tell, are broadly supportive of Hamas, it does say something about Palestinians as well. And so if on uh, the 7th of October, Hamas uh, did invade uh, these Israeli settlements and military bases, and as the Israelis claim, wanted purely just out of hatred for Jews to kill as many Israelis as they could and not only kill them, but burn them alive, uh, rape them, behead them, uh, you know, stab pregnant uh, women, uh, killing fetuses, things like that. You know, uh, I think I think that makes a difference. And, and that's just not uh, what happened. And, you know, Hamas did use violence on the day and you know, they killed some people, in my opinion, they, you know, they weren't justified in killing, but that was not the, the purpose of the operation was not to kill uh, a bunch of civilians uh, or as many civilians as they could. The purpose was to attack military bases and to attack settlements, which are, you know, dual military civilian um, uh, uh, areas where they basically helped to enforce the siege on Gaza. And so for Hamas to break out of, you know, Gaza being, again, the world's largest concentration camp, it was inevitable that they were going to come in contact with some civilians and kill some civilians. But that wasn't their objective, to kill as many civilians as they could. The objective was to attack these military bases and to take as many captives or hostages as they could back to Gaza in order to have leverage to try to break the siege long term, uh, to you know, have Palestinians who were held hostage or captive in Israeli prisons to have them returned. And, um, you know, that was the, that's really, you know, what happened. So I think it is, again, important to understand that Hamas isn't some evil organization of people that are just trying to murder and rape and, and kill, even though, as you're pointing out, if they really had done that and done all the things that the Israelis said, that still would in no way justify what Israel has done since then, which is, of course, a legitimate genocide, you know, killing uh, over 30,000 people, probably much higher than that, of course, uh, you know, probably 25,000 women and children. Even if they had done all those terrible things Israel claimed on the 7th of October, it still wouldn't justify what Israel has done since then. But I think it still is important to understand that actually it was the Israelis themselves that in my opinion killed most of the civilians who died, uh, most of the Israeli civilians who died on 7th of October. Israel is the one who burned these people alive uh, using uh, you know, heavy weapons from helicopters, tanks, uh, armed drones. Um, and that says a lot about Israel, that they're willing to kill their own uh, civilians in huge numbers, you know, hundreds at least, just in order to justify the ability to go in and kill that many Palestinians and potentially conquer Gaza and take it over, uh, annex it, ethnically cleanse the two uh, million Palestinians that live there and try to rebuild, uh, you know, settlements like Gush Katif that they, you know, uh, that were dismantled back in 2005. Um, anyway, it was kind of a long winded answer, but I think, I think it, it's just important to know what really did happen on the 7th of October and who did what just to understand that Hamas is not this evil uh, organization that is Israel has made it out to be. So I guess at the outset, it's probably useful to think about that. You do this very good thing at the intro where you explain the kind of colonial origins of not just the Gaza Strip, like how it came to be in existence, but also the so-called, the so-called, um, these these settlements, right, that are just outside the Gaza, you know, separation fence, right, which is the concentration camp, as you correctly call it. Can you describe these? I think there's three of them, right? 
Well, there's there's quite a few, but there's several big ones. Like Barry is a big one. Uh, Kafar uh, Kafar Aza is a big one. Um, but they they sometimes call it the Gaza envelope because there are these uh, these this ring of settlements that surround Gaza, and of course the Israelis call them kibbutzim. But the whole purpose of those, that's part of the Zionist movement from the earliest days, was to establish these colonial out, military outposts that have a dual role of having settlers there to settle the land and farm it, but then also to be armed and help um, not only protect you know, uh, land that the Israelis had conquered, but then also to continue expanding um, their conquests uh, even further. And so uh, those play a huge role in, again, creating the concentration camp-like conditions in, in Gaza. And so when Hamas tried to break out uh, of Gaza, it was inevitable that along the roads that they were traveling to reach the military bases, that they would encounter civilians uh, driving on those roads. There are uh, Israeli soldiers that are based in those kibbutzim or settlements. Every time they attack Gaza and bomb it, this is um, they use those uh, settlements as staging grounds. So, in the Israeli narrative, Hamas broke into these, you know, peaceful uh, settlements or peaceful communities. They would call them, and they just totally uh, ignore the 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 dual military civilian role that these um, that these communities play. Really, as these colonial military garrisons is one way some Israelis have described it. Um, so I think that's important to understand is the nature of the kibbutzim because you're always asking, you know, on 7th of October, you see all these videos of these Hamas guys driving around in what look like purely civilian areas. And without that context of understanding their military role and their role in settling and conquering territory and then forcing the siege on Gaza, it, it doesn't make sense why these Hamas guys would be walking around in what appears to be the, is like a regular suburb of like, you know, Chicago or something like that, you know? So I guess there's a good quote. I was thinking of reading Hungarian born. This is from early in the article. Hungarian born Israeli sociologist, Joseph Ben David pointed out, pointed to the role of the kibbutzim surrounding Gaza as military garrisons writing in 1964, quote, the kibbutzim will still serve to some extent as military outposts and as first defense lines. And that uh, end quote, and that defending the borders, including from infiltration from by Palestinians wishing to return to their homes, quote, cannot be effectively carried out by the army without the active participation of the settlers. When I saw this, when I read this, I hadn't I realized I, I hadn't really thought about the actual purpose of the of the Gaza envelope. And I'm beginning and, and it's sort of like there's this like kind of like, you know, light bulb ding over my head. And I was like, oh, these are. Like these kibbutzims are just border towns, like what are called here border towns, right? Where which are these towns that are just outside of indigenous reservations that settlers in the U.S. and Canada too um, have set up over the course of centuries that work as these kind of policing zones, but also to sort of you know to keep these natives in check, right? And so like these border that these like kibbutzim. They've been manufactured to us in this imagination. Oh, they're socialist. Oh, they have all this a wide array of people. But these are colonial outposts. This is a garrison that help enforce a like 15 year long, more than almost 18 year long siege of almost 2 million people, right? Like suffocating siege, like people dying of cancer, waiting to get permission to leave Gaza, who die right there to go to Egypt. like. This is the people who administer that, like this is one cog of it. Because having military there wouldn't would would make it look like, oh, okay, those are legitimate targets, right? But if you call them kibbutzim, and if you call them and you and you narrate and you show that, oh, these are civilians, even though they have weapons available to them in large numbers, as you show, and even greater now, that this is that this is a colonial outpost border town. This is a place where settler colonialism comes into close contact with the indigenous people that it conquered or tried to conquer, but couldn't necessarily get them out and instead enclose them into the world's most advanced concentration camp. Yeah, and that's and that's why, too, there's often a military base and an accompanying kibbutz of the same name. So like Nahal Az 
which is right on the border where a lot of these um, Israeli soldier spotters were, were based. A lot of them were female. There's both a military base and a kibbutz. Same with the Re'im. There's a military base and a kibbutz. And that was the main target of the Hamas attack was the Re'im military base where the Gaza division is based. And they're right, they're right next to each other. So if you want to attack the, the military base, you have to drive on the same road and take control of the same, you know, junction on the highway uh, that goes right to the kibbutz where civilians live um, if you want to attack the military base. And it's the reason why the Hamas fighters ended up at the Nova Music Festival, because that was like three kilometers down the road from the Re'im kibbutz and military base. And um, I mean, the Hamas fighters stumbled on on that music festival. They didn't know about it in advance. But again, from the Israeli narrative, the military aspect is just totally erased. And Hamas just deliberately went into civilian areas to try to murder women and children. And, and, and that's just totally not uh, what happened at all. <clears throat> so maybe can you, from all your from all your reading and like, I mean, it's very extensive as usual. This is kind of, this is your game. Uh, like this is your shtick. I think <laughs> you just have this very deep ability to read and like collate all this information, which incidentally makes it hard for, I think uh, like there's a difficulty in reading your articles just because of the scale, not in the necessarily amount of time that it takes to read them. Cause everybody reads at a different pace, but you know, there are, there are so many different sites that you're trying to put together and the complication and like the complicating factor of all this is that all the lies that have been spewed and spread and obfuscations and and these are things that have now filtered into like the into like how we discuss these things. So just last night, the Canadian Parliament is doing like a is doing this kind of like motion or whatever. And they like go on to they say, that oh, Hamas massacre, 1200 Israeli something, something on. I don't remember if they said civilian. I don't remember. But like there is this complete um wholesale like uh like belief in this narrative of what happened so i guess in some ways from this in-depth reading that you did in this article i think you you, I mean, you told me yesterday it took me took you months to read to write if from your depths can you give us a kind of bird's eye view of what happened on october 7th you can take your time obviously in this answer because it's not a simple thing yeah, so to tr yeah, so to try to kind of summarize the dynamics of what happened is that the Hamas fighters or from the Qassam brigades, the military wing of Hamas and also from uh, some other Palestinian resistance factions when they broke through the fence they attacked the military bases that were uh you know closest by and then uh you know killing some soldiers uh taking others captive and then they also did move into the uh, kibbutzim or the settlements, where they uh, where where they have these security squads that uh, that are armed, and also a lot of the residents are, are are soldiers, either active duty or reserve. And they went in and they did start taking uh, people captive. And in order to do that, they oftentimes or the 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 settlers or the Israelis living in the kibbutzim they all have these safe houses or safe rooms in their houses, which are meant to protect them in case of Hamas rocket fire. So people would go into the rooms and try to barricade themselves inside. The Hamas guys would come, try to get the people, take them back to Gaza as captives. And to do that, they would sometimes shoot through the doors. For example, if if they couldn't, you know, break into that safe safe room, they would, you know, fire a few bullets into the into the lock of the door. And there were some Israelis who were killed, you know, just being on the other side, um, including, if I remember correctly, the the one uh, baby that died uh, during the uh, attack from Barry uh, Mia Cohen, if I remember correctly was killed when a Hamas fighter just shot through the door and, and the baby happened to get hit on the other side. So it wasn't a deliberate effort to kill people, but it was a deliberate effort, you know, using violence to try to take them captive. But then what would happen is that the Israelis in responding to that situation, uh, rather than worrying about the lives of the captives that Hamas was trying to take uh, back to Gaza, 
they dispatched uh, the Apache helicopters and these Zeke uh, armed drones. And they just started, you know, unloading and shooting missiles uh, and, and, and heavy high caliber machine guns at the houses where the Hamas fighters and uh, the Israeli uh, Israelis uh, were, were barricaded inside. And so if you look at all the, the aerial footage, for example, of the different kibbutzim, they're all like on fire, all these homes are flattened. And the journalists, when they would come in to those um, communities of the kibbutzim after, um, after the battles took place, they see all these destroyed homes and the Israeli army spokespersons guiding the journalists around would say, hey, look at this home that's flattened. Hamas did that. And look at the people that were burned to death inside. Hamas did that. But it was really, you know, for the most part, the helicopters and, and, and the drones that responded very, very quickly. The Israeli army didn't respond yeah. for quite a while. It took them hours to respond. And that's kind of another topic as to why potentially. But the drones and the helicopters were in the air, you know, within uh, the first hour. And, and they were just um, they were just going crazy unloading uh, on the kibbutzim. So then there were multiple instances where Hamas would, you know, take people from uh, uh, a home and be heading back towards Gaza in a car um, or even uh, maybe on foot. Um, and then they'd be getting close to the border. They're out in the open in these open fields along the Gaza border. And the same thing would happen. The helicopters and the drones would show up and they just unloaded and uh, were killing everybody, both the Hamas fighters and the Israeli civilians. And there's kind of an idea that, oh, maybe they couldn't distinguish who was who. But again, from Israeli media, it's clear that the Hannibal Directive was uh, issued. The Israeli forces were told deliberately to kill uh, Israeli civilians because that prevents Hamas from being able to take them captive back to Gaza and have this leverage to do a, you know, a prisoner exchange later on. And, um, and that's really how, in my opinion, most of the people died that day. Hamas, again, wasn't trying to deliberately kill as many people as they could. They killed some people, but that wasn't, uh, the, the orders that were given in, in my opinion, and that wasn't what they, what they were doing. But so many people died and there was so much destruction because of the, the heavy weapons from the Israeli uh, helicopters, drones, and then, and then also tanks even. So that's kind of the general dynamic. And, you know, one thing that was really interesting, there's this bizarre situation where in one of the kibbutzim, there were some Hamas uh, fighters that gathered, uh, you know, a couple families uh, together in one home. And they, live, they started live streaming it on Facebook. And, you know, in the Israeli media, every article you read, it would be like, well, you know, Hamas was trying to like publicize their atrocities and show, you know, all the terrible murders they were trying to commit. But in one of the videos, if you pay attention, one of the Hamas guys says he asked one of the women who is being held captive in this home, he says, tell your Air Force not to bomb this place. And so that's another indication that the Hamas guys in my opinion, they were taking also hostages uh, in many cases just so they could try to get back to Gaza because the helicopters were in the air, the drones were in the air, and they thought mistakenly that if they had Israelis with them, that that would allow them to be able to get back to Gaza without being uh, killed uh, by the Israeli Air Force. But again, because of the Hannibal Directive, that was a, a wrong assumption to have. And so you have multiple examples of where um, people who were taken captive said that the Hamas guys treated them like, you know, very well with respect. You have a weird instance of a, of a, of, a, of an elderly couple in uh, Ofakim, where the woman um, she ended up surviving, and she talked about how she was like, you know, cooking food for the Hamas guys, and they were singing, like Israeli songs together. There's there's just multiple. Um, instances like that again it just indicates that the Hamas guys were not trying to just murder as many people as they could but they were trying to take captives and the Israeli response to that was just to use this overwhelming uh, uh violence and they are the ones that again killed in my opinion most of the people that uh that died that day including in the very brutal terrible ways like 
people being burned alive. Um, and again, they, you know, the, the Israelis would just turn around and say, oh, look how evil Hamas did. And there's people that we know for sure were killed um, by the Israelis. Um, and again, they, they were burned alive and there's barely anything left of, of their remains of their bodies. And we know for sure that that uh, the Israelis killed them. And yet Israeli um, politicians come out and say, look how evil Hamas is because they killed this and this people. The, 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 the best example of that is this 12 year old girl and her 12 year old, her twin brother, uh, Lil Hetzroni, um, who was killed, uh, you know, by tank fire. Um, so again, that's the, that's the general dynamic of, of, of what was happening, uh, that day. It wasn't that Hamas was just going in murdering as many people as, as they could. And then on, on, in regards to the sexual stuff, and rapes, which is obviously being pushed really, uh, really, really hard by the Israelis and has, especially lately, but even uh, since the beginning of 7th of October, there's instances where um, one family, they were, they were, uh, the, this is actually Islamic Jihad guys, they, they took a family, a, a woman and her daughters out of a house. And the 17 year old daughter was wearing like a, just like a sports bra. And an Islamic Jihad fighter, you know, grabbed a shirt off of the um, clothesline and gave it to the to the young girl and said, hey, here, put this on. You know, so there's multiple accounts like that that just don't square with the idea that um, Hamas was just rampaging through these communities trying to murder people. And again, they were, it was all in the context of a battle in the Israeli narrative. There's no there's no they, they're not talking about the helicopters they're not talking about the drones. They tell the story as if it was just Hamas there and just civilians, and that's it. And they omit, uh, for the most part, um, any mention that... Um so I guess at the end of the day, what's left to be said about, about October 7th was that... <laughs> The fear of the like the the use of the Hannibal Doctrine, right? And this is the the explicit policy. I mean, they they say that they don't do it anymore, but it's a named policy of the Israeli military, which is to kill and eliminate. Um, it's it's worse for which is this way, like basically, it's worse for the Israeli state to have to negotiate with, uh, with their enemy around capture around captives than it is to just simply kill everyone associated with the act including the captive themselves and then use use the death of that precious settler to wage an immense amount of violence and that seems to be the game right that seems to be and if they can't and if they can't get and this is why the panic i think that's set upon and that you describe in your article that set upon the media, the Israeli political class, is that this was a humiliating blow to Israeli power, right? Here they are, like, think of, think of, like, the meaning in some ways of, like, holding a festival outside of this concentration camp. You're shaking your asses off of psychedelic drugs, listening to, like, techno music, like, laughing at the people who are, like, that you're, like, your military, like, like, starve and besiege for years and years that like you conquered and you forced into this concentration camp and now you're dancing outside of their concentration camp. I mean, just looking at like the maps and like the sort of like a satellite overview. I mean, this was like, th these were kilometers away. You could walk from Gaza, which is what these guys did. Not all of them. I imagine some of them did. Some of them probably had motorcycles after they broke through the fence and like, you know, vans and stuff. But ultimately, like, this is not a far distance. And so there's like an intimacy of Israeli settler colonialism that blew up in their face, I feel, on October 7th. That they thought that they could stay this close to the indigenous people that they conquered for so long and never risk their lives. And in fact, flaunt that, uh, that conquest by hosting these festivals, right, so close to the border. And so it, it kind of, I feel like we can, you, you know, I don't, I don't try to psychologize because ultimately like I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained in this stuff. And like, I don't meet people to like, you know, have any inputs around any of this. Like I don't meet Israeli settlers, but like ultimately like there is, there, there does tell you something about the psychology of Israeli settler colonialism that 
on the one hand, you know, like purports to have so much control over these indigenous Palestinians that they that they've conquered, right? That they can host these festivals, but at the same time, they have so little control that this, you know, relatively, you know, a straightforward, not to say unsophisticated, but a relatively straightforward, let's say, brute force attack that the Palestinian resistance carried out on October 7th, which was on the one hand, like overwhelming the Iron Dome with like 5,000 rockets and causing causing chaos, right? Which then they used as a cover to like cover their infiltration. I mean, this is not this is not rocket science in a way, right? What they planned. It was audacious, right? And it was something that had that they had never experienced before at such a scale. And I feel like I've seen these interviews with Hamas guys, political guys in the aftermath saying that, you know, we didn't expect for October 7th to be as successful as it was, right? That we were envisioning this kind of small scale. But when they they realized they were not confronting any violence, and uh, they were not confronting, you know, a real uh, a force of Israeli, uh, Israeli military to protect them, right? It took them hours to get there, as you said. Right. That the opportunity to grab more captives. Right. You know what our Western press called hostages. But of course, they never called that when Israelis capture their own hostages, which they do to a much greater extent. So that when this happened, that the scale of what was happening wasn't apparent to anyone, that it only took us several hours for them to say, like, wow, they like this was an audacious, audacious attack that resulted in a nightmare for Israeli planners. And if the fact that like, what is it, 150 by the end of the day were taken into Gaza? I mean, imagine 230, okay, 230. I, the last number I had was 150, but the, I guess the, like that, imagine how many more would have been taken in if they hadn't pursued this Hannibal directive, right? Um, and they were expecting stiff resistance and they were expecting to encounter like the most elite uh, Israeli units that would know a lot about them. And and they just didn't face that initially until they got into the communities. And then again, the Israelis relied for the most part, instead of trying to send the army in quickly, they just started bombing from the air. And so that made it again so that the Hamas guys took more captives. And again, in my opinion, I think they took a lot of them just to ch simply try to get back to Gaza and avoid the helicopter fire. So the Hamas leadership was surprised at how many captives were taken. They were surprised at how many Israelis were killed because I don't think they understood, probably by now, obviously, but not initially. They didn't understand that it was the helicopters and the and the drones that were that were unleashed in such a a, a a massive way, and so everything just got got magnified. And again, there are certain elements of um, the Israeli military and intelligence establishment and political establishment that I think were happy for the opportunity to launch again the war on Gaza and and, and commit the genocide that they're doing uh, now. And like Bezalel Smotrich, for example, the right-wing settler uh, minister, the finance minister, on 7th of October during a cabinet meeting, he, he stressed that the army should not take the fate of the captives into consideration, and instead they should just hit Hamas hard. So there are those segments of people who didn't really care that they were killing their own people. And again, I think they they were happy to even inflate the numbers by of dead by killing them themselves because it just gave them more of a pretext to try to reconquer Gaza and show to the United States, for example, that, oh, look how evil Hamas is. You need to send us, you know, a, a lot of weapons, which the Israelis need. Of course, they can't uh, do what they're doing in Gaza without these regular U.S. military uh, or shipments of, of bombs from the U.S., so they, they were quite happy to sacrifice large numbers of their own civilians for this ideological goal of, of retaking uh, Gaza and reestablishing uh, settlements there. But um, I don't know, again, maybe we should talk, is it okay to talk more about the, the Nova Music Festival itself? Because I think there's, you know, of course, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what happened, what happened there. Yeah, of course, of course, go ahead. So again, I, you know, in the first 
this is another thing that made it difficult to understand what happened that day because Israel released a lot of footage, but it was all edited and it omitted all these important things. And so it gave a totally distorted, unclear, incorrect view of what happened. So at the at the Nova Music Festival, which, as, as you said, was right on the, the border um, and it was right by this military base, which people don't mention. So Hamas was in the process of attacking the military base, the Re'im military base, and they came across this uh, party. And according to the Israeli narrative, the Hamas guys, unopposed as the party was still happening, just started massacring people. And supposedly there was 364 people killed. And so that was the largest number of people killed in any one you know, place on October 7th was at, was at the party. And so they say, yeah, Hamas just went in and was massacring people for literally for hours without any Israeli forces there. Um, but it turns out that, again, as I mentioned earlier, helicopters and drones were dispatched very, very quickly um, on that morning to the different sites. And that happened at the at the Nova Festival as well, where the Apache helicopters and the, the drones um, were there and were opening fire on people. And the aftermath of that, you witness from all this aerial footage of how many destroyed and burned cars there were. And the Apache helicopters and drones, or the Apache helicopters, sorry, were probably uh, using these 230 millimeter machine guns that fire um, incendiary rounds. And that's why all the cars were burned. And that was why there were so many burned bodies. There were literally bodies that were burned so badly, just to almost to total ash that there were sometimes two bodies accidentally were buried together because the, you know, the, the rescue workers couldn't distinguish or, or could, didn't realize that it was just, it was two bodies or two victims there instead of just one, cause they had been burned to death so badly. Um, but that was due to these incendiary munitions being um, fired from the helicopters. So that's one important thing to keep in mind, which is an indication that again, most of the people killed at the party were killed by Israeli forces. But also very critically, and again, this this was to almost totally omitted. You had to had to read like so many accounts of what happened at the at the Nova Festival to, to see details of of this next part, which is that members of the border police, and specifically from this elite um, commando unit called the Yamam, they were dispatched to the Nova Festival extremely early by transport helicopter. And so even though it took the army hours to respond, these elite commando units were like the helicopters and the drones were there from extremely early on as the, the party goers were evacuating the site because they shut the party down once Hamas fired the rockets at 6.30 a.m. So the, the organizers of the, of the party shut the music off, told everyone you know, to, uh, to get in their cars and leave. There's only one road out of there, only one highway, and um, there were multiple accounts of partygoers who said that the the um, Israeli police, these border police, blocked um, the road. They set up checkpoints on both sides of where the party was, and that basically trapped all these people, created this traffic jam. I mean, all of us have been to concerts, and, and you're trying to leave at the end, and it's just a mess. So imagine that, plus the police set up these uh, checkpoints that block the road. Um, and then there were um, multiple um, party goers who reported that there were people in Israeli uniforms that opened fire uh, on people. And so again, the border police, these Yamam uh, special commando units were there and the Hannibal directive was issued and so these were the guys firing on uh, the party goers. I mean, Hamas may have done that to a certain extent, too. There, there's some video of some Hamas guys throwing some grenades into some of these bomb shelters where usually there was some party goers plus a policeman or two or three and some, and, or soldiers. But there are these accounts of, of again, party goers saying people in Israeli police uh, uniforms opening fire on the party goers. And, um, and so, again, there was this big battle taking place. The Hannibal Directive um, was implemented. And so, again, that's why you have in place 
um, because of, of those two factors, in my opinion. And that's what I feel like I convincingly show. In, in Yeah, I mean, it's if you think about it for a second, like and if you think if you do the sort of if you try to just get these sort of like cartoonish images of of Palestinian villainy out of your head, what would be the value of murdering Israelis just right there on the spot? What would be the strategic value? You just break in like with like what? A few hundred guys and you go and you murder? Like how far will that get you to liberating Palestine? Like it makes no sense. It actually makes no sense to just kill, right? Like that's not like the the political position from which Palestinians wage their liberation struggle does not it does not benefit them to simply kill for sport, right? That's actually what benefits the Israeli side way more because they need to flex on their enemies, right? Like they need to flex on the indigenous people that they rule over. So the whole thing about Hamas just murdering their way through these innocent towns, I mean, it makes no sense. It actually makes no sense. They like Israel has shown that it's what it's willing to give up for just one guy, like Gilad Shalit, right? Just one guy, five years. I mean, Yahya Sinwar is in power because Palestinian resistance nabbed Gilad Shalit and a couple of other guys too, right? Um, Gilad, I think, was the only one who survived. But like, this is the this is the sort of open secret of all of our media class who are parroting this story it's that it makes no actual sense for them to to send this small force and then have behind them like a wave of Palestinian civilians who haven't seen their lands ever in seventy five years who are in who are like caged in like prisoners right who are then who are behind them. And that was another complicating factor in all of this, too, was the fact that we're Palestinian non non combatants who came in to like basically see these lands who basically and some of them in the end also took back their own captives. Right. And so there is an interesting there's an interest. I mean, I guess it's not interesting. It's not surprising, too. But the idiocy with which that this story is, is going is amazing that they really do think Palestinians are like dumb brainless animals that have no thought other than just killing Jews. Yeah. And so maybe to, to illustrate that further, I mean, the, you're, you're right. The incentives, the incentives in place indicate that Palestinians were not just trying to murder as many people as they could. And that the Israelis in fact were trying to kill as many of their own people as they could to prevent them from being taken captive um, because they didn't want to deal with a situation like they had with Gilad Shalit, where they had to exchange over a thousand Palestinians just to get one soldier back, and and by by Hamas having captives inside of Gaza, that also tied their hands in terms of trying to destroy Gaza, ethnically cleanse it, and annex it again. And so, for example, um, there was one um, woman who was taken uh, captive by Hamas back to Gaza, and she was. Um, being held, uh, I believe initially in, they were like in a grocery store, which the Israelis bombed. And then later they were in a house. I have to double check that detail, but what I remember for sure is that then later she was in a house and the area was being bombed and the, the, her captors, the, the captors, the Hamas guys literally put, uh, a mattress over her and then, and the other captives, and they were laying on top of the mattress to try to shield the Israeli hostages from the Israeli bombing because they were, the captives were that valuable to them. They needed to keep them alive because they wanted, they needed them for a prisoner exchange to free these Palestinian hostages in Israeli prisons. But the Israelis were literally trying to bomb the areas where their own captives were just to be rid of the problem. Um, of them being there in Gaza, which was again tying their hands from executing the war, because Netanyahu he's got all these uh, families of the hostages uh, protesting, demanding that the war end, uh, demanding that the bombing of Gaza stop so they can get their family members back. And Netanyahu and Ben Gavir and Smotrich they they just want the hostages dead so they can move forward with the war without any without any problem. And so those same incentives were in place in the kibbutzim. Those same incentives were in place at the Nova Festival, where again, the Israelis were incentivized to literally kill 
their own people use as much violence as they possibly could in order to take back the settlements and kill all the Hamas guys. Whereas the Hamas guys were incentivized, you know, just the opposite. They wanted to get these people themselves and these um, Israeli captives back to Gaza as safely as they could. So that's an, another instance, or there's quite a few instances, for example, in the kibbutzim where you'll read an account in Israeli media and it will say, oh, this and this person was murdered by Hamas. It's like, oh, okay. They just, they, of course, take that for granted. If someone died that day, then they must have been murdered by Hamas. And then you read more and you read more and more accounts and it's like, oh, well, actually Hamas came into the house, took them captive, and then no one really knows for sure what happened after that. But guess where the, the Israeli's body was found? Again, burned, totally burned to death, dismembered. Their body was found like right near the Gaza border. Like, okay, well, why would a Hamas guy come into a house if they just wanted to murder people? They could just shoot, you know, the captive in the head right there in the living room and be done with it. But instead, they actually take the person towards the border and then and then they just execute and like burn someone to death, like right on the Gaza border. No, they were trying to get the person captive back to Gaza. And then the helicopters came, were firing these um, incendiary munitions. And, and that's why the, you know, the person's uh, uh, body was found on the border. There was one case I mentioned in, in the paper where there was this older woman. She was maybe 80 years old and her autistic granddaughter. And, you know, both of their bodies were found, you know, totally burned and barely recognizable right on the Gaza border. And it took like a few weeks to identify them. You know, everyone thought they had they were missing. They were um, captive in Gaza somewhere until their bodies were finally identified. A lot of cases where, again, bodies could only be identified by dental records because the bodies were burned so badly. Again, you know, right somewhere near the border. Um, so, again, th those incentives of, uh, of, of who benefited from killing and who didn't are really important to understand the dynamics of the. So, in, I mean, you watched a lot of the videos coming out from the Israeli side and, you know, you make this point from uh the from in this article about the what lessons can be drawn from in Syria and how there was a lot of atrocity porn. I mean you don't use that term but I'm I'm using that term but like there was a lot of atrocity porn that comes out of Syria and it's and obviously the goal of it and the reason why our media spreads it is to help lay the groundwork or to help build consent for you know, military action, right? Direct military action, right? And so that was the Ruta chemical attack, right? Like, which you've written about. And also, like, you know, we know the role of the white helmets and also the whole project of manufacturing the white helmets as this, like, as these group of heroes, right? And the Israeli, the Israeli version of this is interesting, right? Because it's a it's 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 the same game right it's it's a matter of manufacturing a story of evil versus innocence right of oh this is why we have to take the the measures that we have to do that we have to take like this is why because of this but what's interesting is that like you know in some of the videos these guys are holding guns and recording with the one hand like in their camera like on their cameras right like like what kind of police officer is like recording himself and like taking away his own ability to like do his job, right? Where where there could be, you know, like lethal fighters just sitting around the corner, right? So there is a lot of drama that has been created out of all of this in the sense that like drama in the sense that like, oh, there are these good and bad characters and we, we, we know who the right side is. And you realize that like, yeah, like this is the same game because it's it's mediatic right like it's something for like consumption later on and i'm beginning to realize now that a lot of this is actually just for israeli cons consumption right a lot of this was for was for manufacturing consent among their own population of like yeah we're going to about to we're going to do a genocide and we this is why because if we don't genocide them we're going to they're going to genocide us right like this completely preposterous i mean and to this day most of the israeli population not only support what's happening in gaza but they also call for for and, and so a lot of them say that it's not enough right and so it's interesting what would you say like from from the videos you watched the tone of the videos and like the tone of the coverage 
like what 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 does it reflect the current state of the Zionist project? If if you can if you can read into that. Yeah, I mean there 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 was a lot of uh, funny business like that, as you mentioned. You were referring to a video of a of a of an elite like commando who shot a video supposedly where he comes across all these dead bodies in at the Nova Festival and the bodies definitely look dead, but the video itself is is staged. And so we don't know how those uh, people actually died. And it is very reminiscent of the situation in Syria, whether where there was a lot of use of video to um, either fake massacres or, you know, film massacres like false flag massacres that could be blamed on uh, on the other side as the Guta chemical attack definitely was. Um, and the other thing to mention is that, you know, the Zaka, these uh, religious volunteers that were collecting the bodies, they're the ones that spread, um, representatives of that group are the ones that spread most of the craziest lies, you know, 40 beheaded babies, uh, you know, uh, pregnant women having the fetuses uh, cut out of, uh, you know, murdered and having the fetuses cut out of their stomachs. Most of those crazy stories came from these rescue organizations like Zaka. And Zaka, for example, they are are basically like an intelligence cutout. Uh, you know, a guy on their board is had, has been in Israeli intellig intelligence for like 20 years. And a lot of the um, people who appeared in the media, um, you know, claiming to be Zaka representatives were actually Israeli soldiers, but they would throw these yellow vests on and uh, go on TV as if they were from the religious rescue organization. And in fact, they were also in the army. And so the Israeli um, military was using those organizations to launder their propaganda and launder false atrocity stories, just like the White Helmets did uh, in Syria. And, you know, when the White Helmets finally left Syria, they were, they were finally had to be evacuated out of uh, Syria. Where did they escape to? Of course, they escaped to Israel. So again, this is another indication that um, the Israeli government is is uh, deliberately um, spreading uh, propaganda, and uh, and Zaka played a big part of it, part in that. But they they found it useful to try to use this apparently credible third party rescue organization. You know who who could you who could be more trustworthy than these volunteer brave rescuers, whether they're the White Helmets or whether they're Zaka? I mean, this is the new game to try to launder the atrocity porn, as you mentioned, and then that can in turn can be uh, used to to carry out um, the military intervention that you want to do um, uh, in response, supposedly in response. Um, I know you're I know you're on a timeline, so we should probably wrap up. Um, so after so the, all this time, all this time that you spent, you know, researching this article, what was was there a moment where you were where you know there was like a kind of light bulb over your head or did you did you approach this from you know the pretty i, mean, I don't think i mean I, the hannibal directive is well known and you know at the beginning of all this i wondered i was like is this really true what they're saying why would they just massacre why would the hamas guys just massacre them it makes no sense like was there and how did you approach like was there a kind of eureka moment or did you go into this kind of being like i know about hannibal i know what is really like military does, like let's let's sort of look into these claims. Claims. Uh, you know that there was because at first I kind of thought to myself, I don't know, there are these videos coming out of you know Hamas like shooting people. And again, there are some instances of that. But the more you read, again, you just read Israeli media says this person was murdered by Hamas, and if you just sit. And, and wait for a second and say, oh, is that really the case? Well, maybe let me try to find some more information. Let me read two, three, four, or as many accounts as you can possibly find about that one particular person. And it just over and over again, the Hannibal Directive just, just came back again and again and again and again. And it just colors everything that happened that day in every location, in the military bases, in the kibbutzim, at the Nova Festival, even with the Nova Festival, initially I kind of thought, I don't know, I mean, most of these people at the party, they were young. A lot of them were either active duty soldiers or they were ex-soldiers, reservists. You know, most of the people were 
between 20 and you know 40 years old, which is the people that are in the army in Israel, including women. And I kind of thought, I don't know, maybe the Hamas guys were like, hey, these are army. All these people are soldiers. They're settlers. Let's just kill them all. Because that's the impression that it gave. But then the more I researched it, the more I researched it, it's like, no, like, that's just not what was happening. Again, the, the, the border police, the Imam commando units were on the ground. They got there early. They were sent by these transport helicopters. They were opening fire on people. The helicopters were just bombing away, going crazy. And um, so, but yeah, once, once you realize that the Hannibal Directive was in force, and then you go back and start reading about the events that day with that lens in mind, suddenly like the evidence just pops up everywhere. You're like, oh, yep, that person, you know, uh, died on, on the border and their body was burned to death. So now we can see what happened. And then there were accounts of, of Israelis who survived and said, yeah, the helicopters did open fire on us, you know. Um, so there's even an account from a woman in the uh, Holit where she was taken uh, – uh, captive by these Hamas guys and it was pretty famous because the Hamas guys released a video of them um, you know with these kids in a home and they were like rocking uh, this baby in a cradle and another Hamas fighter was holding another boy that was a little bit older like three four years old they took those two kids along with another woman from uh, Kibbutz Holit um, back to Gaza and just as they reached the border they just let the kid and the the kids and the woman go and israel said in the israeli media most of the, most of the accounts said that that she escaped but there's an actual al jazeera video that showed the moment where the hamas guys are walking with them and then they just stop and say okay here you know go and so again that's an indication that the hamas guys were trying to basically use them as human shields. They just said, we need to get back to Gaza. We'll take these women and kids with us. And when we're back, we'll just let them go. And uh, anyway, so as soon as you know that the Hannibal Directive was in force and that the Israelis either, you know, didn't mind killing as many of their own people as they did, or even felt that they benefited from it. And they wanted to try to kill as many as they could to avoid the problem of having these captives, um, or possibly even just to make Hamas look as bad as possible. Um, you know, that colors everything. In fact, um, Benjamin Netanyahu's son, um, Yair Netanyahu, I believe, he sent out a tweet um, where he basically was saying he was angry at the Air Force because they didn't do their job by killing all of the Israelis. <laughs> yeah. because Hamas did did I manage, remember that tweet because Hamas so crazy yeah Hamas did get you know 230 <laughs> people back to Gaza and it created this huge problem um for Netanyahu for Smotrich and for for Ben Gavir and Netanyahu's son is basically saying you fuckers in the air force if you'd done your job and just killed all of them killed all the Israelis there wouldn't be any captives we wouldn't have this problem we could just you know flatten Gaza um, without any of these uh, families complaining about it. So again, I think that's an incentive too. They literally wanted to like up the body count and up the, you know, to make it appear as if Hamas had committed, you know, as many and as terrible of atrocities as possible because it gave them the advantage to make sure that the U.S. would willingly give as many weapons as they could possibly need, as many 2,000 pound bombs as they could possibly use to literally just wipe out Gaza and turn it into a parking lot. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, how else do you, what else is there left to say? Like, you're talking about a genocidal entity that will sacrifice its own people to do more genocide, to help do more genocide. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not shocked, like, genocidal, a genocidal settler colonial entity will do settler, genocidal settler colonial things. But yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's it, Zionism in its essence, yeah. Um. Thank you, William. This was this was a good conversation. I appreciate this article. I hope as many people read it as possible. I was saying to you earlier off the mic that we should you should break it up into smaller consumable chunks because the sort of wall of text that confronts you when you load up the article, like it took my computer a couple of seconds to download. <laughs> like I got a high speed connection downloading text. It was like it took like a bit. <laughs> funny yeah i need to um, <laughs> find ways to make it more presentable but so i appreciate that feedback but i hope, hope people you know uh, read it and 
and can gain something uh something from it so yeah no it was a great it's a great work uh we should have you back on with asa and you guys should collaborate and to sort of compare notes i mean you cite him in the article you link to him and actually i saw this morning on electronic intifada they interviewed someone who was in one of the vans that was like they were a captive they were like a zionist settler captive being driven away and a helicopter fired on the van hitting all of the resistance guys in the front and one 80 was it like an, a grandmother in the back of the seat so and she thanked she thanked the air force for killing the grand like like it's some crazy story like she basically thanked the air force like it like this is not just israeli like leaders like there's there's something to zionism that says that like it's okay to like kill in the name of the greater zionist project like it's just it's okay to kill our own and you know it's you know there it tell it tells you something i guess it tells you something about the state of of zionism today that like yeah like i mean and yair netanyahu tweeting from like the comforts i mean maybe he wasn't in miami at the time but he is now in miami while you know reservists are being sent and, and dying in gaza in large numbers a lot of their deaths are hidden or they're come back they're mangled they're missing limbs they're traumatized they're burnt to a crisp right like this is not like this is tearing up israeli society it just doesn't show um, it doesn't show in a way that you can see on the screens in terms of what it's being done to Gaza. Well, thank you, William. Thank you for this. Thank you for this article, and uh, and looking forward to having you on again. You on again. Okay, perfect. I love it. I really appreciate you being on, and it's nice to talk to you. Always nice to talk to you. Thanks, William. Thanks, Take William. Care. Take okay. care. Take care, man. <clears throat>